Years ago, there was a popular song written by Dan Goodman and Becky Hobbs, and it was performed by the country music group Alabama. Some of y'all may remember this song. The, the main chorus of the song said, I believe there are angels among us. They are sent down to us from somewhere up above. They come to you and me in our darkest hours to show us how to live, to teach us how to give, and to guide us with the light of love. That song became vastly popular as it resonated with the hearts of so many people who really do believe there are angels among us. And our pop culture has always been filled with the ideas and the concepts of angels, and they've been portrayed in a multitude of ways. Some of you may remember the popular television show, Touched by an Angel. There was a popular love story that I took a couple of dates to the theater to see years ago with Meg Ryan and Nicolas Cage. It was called City of Angels. But what are angels, really? I mean, are they winged, human-looking creatures that float on clouds and play harps? Do we have guardian angels? How many angels are there? And what exactly do angels do? When we die, do we earn wings and become angels? Today, we're going to tackle the subject of angels. So buckle up and get ready. It's 6.05, and we're going live. Dr. Adam Harwood gives us a great definition in his theology section on angelology. Harwood says, quote, Angels are beings created to serve God, doing his will in heaven and on earth, including ministering to you and I, to believers, unquote. You see, angels are spiritual beings. They were created by God. And throughout the scripture, we see them referenced in numerous ways. They're called angels, sons of God, the holy ones, watchers, messengers, cherub, seraph. But only two angels in the Bible are actually mentioned by their name. One is Gabriel and the other is Michael. And the Bible never really tells us how many angels there are. In Revelation 5.11, it mentions thousands upon thousands, ten thousands times ten thousands, meaning numerous angels. And in both the Old and the New Testament, we find appearances of angels regularly in the lives of God's people. And sometimes they appeared in the likeness of people, maybe as men who were clothed in bright or white clothing, such as those who were at the tomb of our risen Lord Jesus. Sometimes they appeared as frightening creatures, as we see in some of the apocalyptic visions in the Old Testament. But one of the most unique statements made in God's word is found in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2, in which we are told that you and I, as God's people, need to always be hospitable to strangers, because we never know when we have actually been showing hospitality to God's angels. So there doesn't really seem to be a uniform appearance for angels in the scripture, and that is called some theologians to, to try and classify angels by appearance. But most common, it seems that angels appear to humans, to God's people, sort of in the form or the likeness of men. And there's a lot we could say about the appearance of angels that is found all throughout the scripture. And there's things we could say about the classification of different angels. But what I want to do today is I just want to talk about what do angels do? I mean, why did God make them? What is the purpose that he created them for? Uh, how do they serve God and serve his people? Well, let me just give you three broad categories and then we're gonna uh, we're gonna add some things to the third category. But category one, I would say that angels worship God. We see this happening in Isaiah chapter six and in Revelation chapter five. And the reason it's important that we take note today that angels worship God is that it's a reminder that angels are like us. They are created being which means we do not worship or pray to angels. We worship and we pray to Yahweh, God the Father, alone, through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. God alone is to be the object of our worship and our prayers. 
Uh, a second categ uh, category we could look at as to why God created angels is that angels are used to carry out God's judgment. We see this in texts like 2 Samuel chapter 24, Matthew 13, Revelation 8 through 10, and then 15 and 16. Uh, but uh, one interesting instance of this would be in Acts chapter 12. When the crowds began to declare that Herod Agrippa was a god. And the Bible says because Herod Agrippa did not immediately deny such claims and give glory to Yahweh as the one true and living God, it says an angel of the Lord struck him down. So one of the categories of ministry that is given to angels in the Bible, not only there to worship and praise God, but they're also there to to carry out God's judgment. Jesus even predicted that when he returns, he will return in judgment with the holy angels of God. Well, a third category uh, of the ministry of angels and why God created angels is angels were created to minister to God's people. In the book of Hebrews, again, it tells us angels are ministering spirits that are sent to serve those who inherit or are heirs of God's great and glorious salvation. So how exactly do they do that? And it's this third category that I want to just mention several different things. First of all, I would say that angels deliver messages to God's people. Uh, we see this when they showed up and told Lot to flee the city of Sodom. It was an angel that told Mary that she would give birth to Jesus. It was an angel who appeared to Cornelius the God-fearer in Acts 10 and told him to send for Peter. So, and a common belief in Second Temple Judaism in the days of Jesus Christ was that angels were messengers of God that delivered messages to God's people. Second, I would say that angels assure God's people. One great example of this is in Acts chapter 27. There is a storm that is threatening to destroy the ship on the Mesopotamian Sea, which in, or the Mediterranean Sea, excuse me. Uh, Paul was on this ship. And it says there was an angel that came to the Apostle Paul and assured him that the ship's uh, people, the passengers would make it ashore, and that Paul would indeed make his way to Rome as God said he would. A third way in which God's angels minister to people is angels guide God's people. Uh, we can see an example of this when the angel guides Philip in the book of Acts that ultimately leads to an encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch which leads to his transformation by the grace of God. So angels are used to guide God's people. Another way in which, uh, a fourth way in which God's angels minister to people is they have been used by God to deliver people. A great example of this that we are probably all familiar with is when Daniel is in the lion's den. And when the this event is over, it is Daniel who declares in Daniel 6.22 that the Lord sent an angel to stop the mouths of the lions. We might also make note of how the apostles were delivered from prison by angels in Acts chapter 5. And again, Peter delivered from prison by an angel in Acts chapter 12. So God has used angels to supernaturally deliver his people from harm and hardship. Uh, another way that God's angels minister to his people is angels are used to strengthen God's people. A couple of examples of this would be uh, Elijah after his battle with the prophet of Baal, prophets of Baal and then he was fleeing from Jezebel when he's in this exhausted and this, this spiritually despondent state he was in, it was an angel that came and nourished and strengthened him. And we might remember our Lord Jesus Christ after 40, year, or 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by the enemy when he is exhausted and he's fasted for 40 days and he's gone through this great test and trial. It is an angel that come or angels that come and they minister to him to strengthen him. There are other things that we could say, but those are the general categories of angelic ministry to the Lord's people that are recorded in Scripture. I'm sure you can think of others, uh, but th there is nothing that suggests in God's Word that angels have ever ceased ministering to and serving God's people as we see in His Word. And that leads to an important question. Do we really have guardian angels? Do we have a guardian angel? Well, 
Now listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 10 regarding some little children. He said, See to it that you do not despise these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Unquote. We might also note that Jesus in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man said it was angels who carried Lazarus into Abraham's bosom. We might also note that there was an angel that came and, and, and he awakened Peter and delivered him from prison in Acts chapter 12. In other words, the Bible most definitely teaches that God has angels that he appoints to guard over and at times miraculously deliver his people. Now, do we definitively say and build large doctrinal beliefs on we have a particular uh, guardian angel with a particular name appointed to us? Well, that's only speculation. But what I can tell you is Jesus himself said of little children, and we see this true of adults, men, women, boys, and girls all throughout the Bible, that God appoints angels to guard over, to watch, to minister to, and to serve his people. Listen, angelology is a fascinating discipline of biblical study and we've only scratched the surface in this brief devotional this week but it should cause us to give thanks to God it should cause our hearts and our minds to rise to Yahweh our Creator and to our Savior the Lord Jesus Christ who uh, and and to the Holy Spirit who illuminates and teaches us these amazing truths from his word about angels and the reason I say we should praise the Father Son and Holy Spirit the one true living God is because God is the one who created the angels. He is the one who commissioned the angels to minister to us. So we give thanks to God as we consider the reality that he created these unique, powerful, spiritual beings and he sends them to serve us, to protect us, to encourage us, to guide us, to, to, to help us in our walk with Christ. And for more on the study of angels, I would recommend Adam Harwood's uh, Christian Theology, which takes a, a historic and systematic and uh, biblical view of theology. And in pages 257 to 275, he gives a brief overview of angels and Satan and demons. I would encourage that there's plenty of other great material out there. My friend uh, Ronnie Phillips, his dad, Ron, wrote a great book about angels. Uh, Michael Heiser, uh, Old Testament and ancient Near Eastern scholar, has done some incredible work, sometimes controversial, on angels and demons and spiritual beings. But there's all kinds of great information out there. And as you listen to this today, maybe you recall a time in which there was seemingly a miraculous deliverance in your life from a near-death experience or something that should have gone or could have gone very wrong but didn't, and you've never really known how you escaped in that moment. Maybe, just maybe, God sent an angel to deliver you. Well, thanks for joining me this week on 605 Live, and I pray that today, today's devotion was in some way a blessing to you and to your family. Make sure you like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and uh, please take time to share this with others and help us spread the good news that King Jesus has come to set the captives free. Now, may the Lord bless you, and may he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you, and may he be gracious to you. May he show you his favor, and give you of his perfect peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.